Welcome to part one of a four-part narrated virtual tour series of U.S. military aircraft exhibited in the Smithsonian's Air and Space Museum's Udvar Hazy Center. The Curtis JN-4D Jenny was introduced in June 1917, just one month after the United States entered the First World War. Curtis's inability to produce enough Jennies to meet the wartime pilot training demand caused the U.S. Air Service to let contracts with six other American manufacturers. More than 90% of American World War I pilots received their primary instructions on it. After the war, thousands of Jennies were sold at surplus prices on the civilian market. With its long, wide wings and slow speed, the Jennies proved ideal for wing walkers and other stunt performers and soon became the mainstay of the barnstorming era. Barnstorming pilots exposed thousands to aviation through passenger rides and aerial circuses, which helped pave the way for today's modern air shows. The Smithsonian acquired this Jenny in 1918 directly from the U.S. War Department. It's one of the finest remaining examples of this truly classic airplane. The Curtis N9 is a seaplane version of the famous Curtis JN4 trainer used by the U.S. Air Service during the First World War. To make the conversion, a single large central pontoon was mounted below the fuselage with a small float fitted under each wingtip along with other modifications. In addition to training 2,500 Navy pilots during World War I, it was used to develop tactics for shipborne aircraft operations in 1916 and 17, using catapults mounted on armored cruisers. The National Air and Space Museum's N-9H is the sole surviving Curtis N-9 seaplane trainer. The Vervel Sperry Messenger is the smallest manned aircraft ever used by the United States Army. It was designed to land in small clearings as well as in forward areas to deliver and pick up messages from field commanders and was also used for aerial spotting and artillery fire control. The displayed aircraft was a commercial Sperry sport plane donated by World War I American ace and Eastern Airline President Edward Rickenbacker in September 1957. The Smithsonian converted it from a sport plane to the single-seat M1 in the early 1960s. This Loeing OA-1A San Francisco is a two-seat amphibious biplane that participated in the historic Pan American Goodwill flight of 1926 and 27. The tour consisted of a flight through Mexico and Central and South America to improve relations with Latin American countries, to encourage commercial aviation, and to provide valuable training to Army personnel. One of the long-term legacies of the Pan American Goodwill flight was that it helped pioneer a trail for later commercial air transportation operations. The San Francisco was transferred to the Smithsonian Institution by the War Department in December 1927 and restored by the National Air and Space Museum in 1964-65. The FB-5 Hawk was Boeing's first true carrier-borne fighter. Twenty-seven were delivered to the Navy in 1927 and were assigned to the USS Langley. This Hawk was modified for operation with the Marines where it served beginning in 1930. In 1928, the Navy decided to standardize on aircraft with air-cooled radial engines resulting in Hawks being stricken from Navy inventory by July 1930. In 1931, Curtis F-9C Sparrowhawks were deployed with the USS Akron and Macon, turning these airships into flying aircraft carriers. Airplanes mounted directly to airships could be used to greatly increase its search range for defense of the airship and for attack. The Akron was lost in a storm in 1933 and the Macon crashed in 1935, relegating Sparrowhawks to utility service until retired in 1937. 
The Boeing P-26P shooter introduced the world to high-performance, all-metal monoplane fighters. It served as America's first line of air defense in the mid to late 1930s when it was replaced by the more advanced Seversky P-35 and Curtis P-36. It was the last open cockpit fighter accepted by the U.S. Army Air Corps and the last with a fixed landing gear and external wing bracing. This airplane was restored by the U.S. Air Force for the Smithsonian and was displayed at the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio until 1975 when the airplane was brought to Washington, D.C. The Colette X-060 was the last version of the U.S. military's unsuccessful association with autogyros during the 1930s and 40s. Unlike a helicopter, an engine does not power the gyroplane's rotor. It drives only the propeller, providing forward motion. The rotor acts like a windmill, and the forward motion of the aircraft provides sufficient airflow to allow the blades to spin in autorotation and generate lift. While they could take off over very short distances and fly at very low speeds, their downfall was their inability to hover. This Sikorsky JRS-1 is the only aircraft in the National Collection that was stationed at Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. JRS-1s immediately began flying many patrol missions, searching for Japanese submarines and for the enemy fleet. The only armament these airplanes carried were depth charges to attack submarines and were only modified to carry weapons after the December 7 attack. The museum's aircraft was struck from service in 1944 and was accepted by the museum in 1960, eventually moving to the restoration hangar in 2011. The Naval Aircraft Factory N3N was extensively used as the primary pilot trainer until the end of World War II. They were the last biplanes to serve in the U.S. military when they were retired in 1961. Their propensity for ground looping on landing led to its Yellow Peril nickname. The narrow landing gear, only 72 and one half inches from the center line of each tire, did not provide much lateral stability at higher touchdown speeds. On June 13, 1946, this N3N, outfitted with floats, became part of the Naval Academy's training squadron at Annapolis, Maryland. The aircraft continued in this role until the spring of 1960 when it was struck from the Navy's inventory. The National Air Museum acquired this aircraft in late 1960. From 1942 to 1945, U.S. Army pilots flew the Lockheed P-38 Lightning over Europe, the Mediterranean, and the Pacific. It was the most successful twin-engine fighter ever flown by any nation and was versatile enough to carry various combinations of bombs, air-to-ground rockets, and external fuel tanks. Severe power plant difficulties along with poor cockpit heating and H and J models made flying and fighting at altitudes that approached 40,000 feet nearly impossible, limiting their performance as bomber escorts in Europe. In the Pacific Theater, Lightnings were among the first American fighter aircraft capable of consistently defeating Japanese fighter aircraft. Lightning pilots were able to down more Japanese aircraft than pilots flying any other Army Air Force's warplane, partially because combat rarely occurred above 20,000 feet in the Pacific Theater. One of the most important Lightning missions was the interception and downing of two Betty bombers, one of which carried Japanese Admiral Yamamoto, the architect of the plan to attack Pearl Harbor. This P-38 was stored in the Oklahoma City Air Depot, a temporary holding area for Air Force Museum aircraft, on June 27, 1945, where mechanics prepared the fighter for flyable storage. During the early 50s, it was moved to the Smithsonian Storage Site at Suitland, Maryland, with restoration commencing in 2001 at the Paul E. Garber facility. Bought Sikorsky's OS-2U Kingfisher was the U.S. Navy's primary ship-based scout and observation airplane during World War II. It handled well in slow flight, 
Thanks to deflector plate flaps that hung from the trailing edge of the wings, ailerons that drooped at low speeds to function like extra flaps, and incorporated spoilers to supplement aileron control. It performed a variety of tasks, training, scouting, bombing, tactical, and utility missions such as towing aerial gunnery targets and chasing practice torpedoes and even anti-submarine warfare in the Atlantic Ocean. For anti-submarine work, ordnance men could suspend two 100-pound bombs or two 325-pound depth charges. Most OS-2Us operated in the Pacific Theater where Kingfisher pilots rescued many downed airmen. In October 1960, the Navy transferred this OS-2U to the National Air Museum. Full restoration began in 1983 and was completed in 1988. Known as the Tomahawk, Warhawk, or Kitty Hawk, the Curtis P-40 was a successful and versatile fighter aircraft during the first half of World War II. It is not ranked among the best overall fighters of the war, but it was a rugged, effective plane available in large numbers early in the war when America and her allies urgently required them. The shark-mouthed tomahawks that General Claire Chenault led against the Japanese remain among the most popular airplanes of the war. Warhawks were the first-line Army Air Corps fighters at the start of the war, but they soon gave way to advanced designs such as the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt and the Lockheed P-38 Lightning. They eventually saw combat in almost every theater of operations, being most effective in the China-Burma-India theater. The Smithsonian P-40 was delivered to Canada as a Kitty Hawk 1A, where it served in the Royal Canadian Air Force. The Royal Canadian Air Force declared it surplus in 1946, and it was eventually returned to the United States. In 1975, Andrews Air Force Base personnel restored the airplane, painting it to represent an aircraft of the 75th Fighter Squadron, 23rd Fighter Group, 14th Air Force. The museum's Martin B-26 Marauder, Flakbait, survived over 200 operational missions over Europe, more than any other American aircraft during World War II. It is currently in the Mary Baker engine restoration hangar. Immediately before the entry of the United States into World War II, the organization of the Civilian Pilot Training Program spurred sales of the Piper J-3 Cub for use as a trainer. 75% of all pilots in the program were trained on Cubs, many going on to more advanced training in the military. Cubs were flown during the war as observation, liaison, and ambulance airplanes, known variously as the L-4, O-59, and NE-1. Civilian-owned Cubs joined the war effort as part of the newly formed Civil Air Patrol, patrolling the eastern seaboard and Gulf Coast in a constant search for German U-boats and survivors of U-boat attacks. This Piper J-3 Cub was donated to the museum in April 1977. Over 10,000 Stearman trainers were built by Boeing's Wichita Division, which had purchased the Stearman Company in the late 1930s. These Model 75 cadets served as the backbone of U.S. Army and Navy primary pilot trainers in World War II. The Boeing Stearman E-75 was the only complete standardization of an Army and Navy production designed aircraft during World War II, which served the Army as the PT-13 and the Navy as the N-2S. After the war, thousands of surplus cadets were sold on the civilian market. They became popular as crop dusters in sports planes and for aerobatic and wing walking use in air shows. The museum's airplane was based in the Atumba, Iowa Naval Air Station, where it was used to train naval aviation cadets until 1946. Jack Northrup designed and his company funded and built the NM-1, the first entirely all-wing aircraft designed, built, and flown in the United States. 
After 200 test flights, Northrop convinced General of the U.S. Army Air Corps Harold Arnold that the results supported continued development of the all-wing concept for a heavy bomber. Northrop built and tested four larger markups called the N-9M and followed up his work with a series of prototype all-wing heavy bombers. None of these aircraft satisfied the heavy bomber needs, so the U.S. Air Force ended the all-wing program in May 1950. Vought Sikorsky's XR-4 helicopter served as the prototype for the world's first mass-produced helicopter. Sikorsky produced 130 R-4s, 55 going to the Army Air Force, 23 to the Coast Guard and Navy, and 52 to Great Britain. The Army Air Force used it mainly as a trainer, but 20 served in the Pacific and Burma theaters during the last 16 months of World War II. Those 20 R-4s performed liaison and rescue duties, including the first medical evacuations by helicopter. In 1938, the United States Navy Bureau of Aeronautics requested proposals from American aircraft manufacturers for a new carrier-based fighter aircraft. The requirement's emphasis for speed overrode all other performance goals, so the most powerful air-cooled radial engine was selected, the Pratt & Whitney R2800. The prototype had wings bent gull-shaped on both sides of the fuselage that reduced drag at the wing-to-fuselage joint and provided additional ground clearance for the biggest propeller ever flown. A 237-gallon fuel tank positioned between the cockpit and engine moved the cockpit back three feet, resulting in the wings blocking the pilot's line of sight during the most crucial stage of landing. This and other negative low-speed effects made early models virtually impossible to land on an aircraft carrier. Since Marine Corps pilots needed improved fighters to replace the Grumman F-4F Wildcat, the Navy accepted them as the Vought F-4U Corsair. Corsairs had an immediate impact on the Pacific Air War as pilots used its speed and firepower when engaging the more maneuverable Japanese airplanes only when these advantage favored the Americans. As a VJ Day, the Navy credited Corsair pilots with destroying 2,140 enemy aircraft in aerial combat while losing 139 Corsairs in combat and 1,435 in non-combat accidents. Later model Corsairs operated from carrier decks and marine airfields during the Korean War. In 1980, National Air and Space Museum's craftsmen restored this F-4U in the colors and markings of a Corsair named Sunsetter, a fighter assigned to Marine Fighter Squadron VMF-113 in 1944. I hope you enjoyed this narrated virtual tour of U.S. military aircraft displayed in the Udvar-Hazy Center of the National Air and Space Museum. The museum is in Chantilly, Virginia, outside of Washington, D.C., is free to visit, but there is a $15 parking fee. If you would like to tour other aircraft in this series, convenient links are in the description section below this video. Here are YouTube's suggested links on similar topics that you may enjoy.